Good afternoon. On behalf of everyone at the American Geographical Society, thank you all for joining us. Well, here we are in the middle of a pandemic on a Saturday afternoon after a very long week. And to complicate things even more, today is Easter Saturday and the end of Passover. And here we are online, as if we haven't had enough Zoom this week. You have got to be the most dedicated teachers in the world. And here you are, not thinking about recovering from the week or spending some time on an enjoyable activity not requiring a computer. Here you are thinking about your students, like you always do. We are so proud to spend this time with you today. I know the next month is going to be tough, and the performance of your students on the exam rarely leaves your mind. Today, we bring you five teachers, most of you know them or know of them, who have spent a great deal of their careers successfully preparing students for the APHG exam. Their objective today is simple but profound. They want to pass along their experience, what works, to you. They know exactly how you feel right now, and they want to help. I have had the pleasure of knowing these people for a couple of years, and I am always so impressed by their dedication, attitude, generosity, and willingness to share their expertise. They want everyone to love geography as they do. To lead off today's event, Dr. Lisa Benton Short, who all of you know is not only a professor of geography at George Washington University, but is also the chief reader designate of the APHG exam. And she's agreed to serve as our moderator. Dr. Benton Short is an internationally recognized geographical scholar and teacher, but I'm convinced her real job is not at GW and being recognized the around the world is not something that's really very important to her. Her real job, and when her eyes light up and you notice a special enthusiasm that's so highly contagious, is when she has the opportunity to interact with all of you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Benton Short. Lisa? Thank you so much, John, for that generous introduction. And it is a real pleasure to see all of you here. Uh, and it's very much in the spirit of AP Human Geography that you have come here, uh, time away from the classroom to learn from some of the best teachers about how to construct an effective review to the AP Human Geography exam for your students. We all know this year has not been easy. Many of you have taught the entire time online some of you have had some of your students, but not all. Hybrid teaching is its own challenge, as well as technology glitches, pets and siblings attending Zoom classes. The distractions and stresses have defined our year and have made teaching and learning far more challenging than ever. All of us here today have experienced these challenges. And so we're very grateful for your energy, your time and your enthusiasm throughout this year and particularly in preparing your students for the AP Human Geography exam. So first, I wanna encourage you to breathe, right? Your students will be okay, they really will. And you will continue to do all the best that you can to help them prepare for the exam. So please breathe. Second, the exam, whether it's on paper or in digitally, will be challenging, but I promise you it will be fair. And I wanna underscore that a student's um, score on the multiple choice part of the exam or even the FRQs does not have to be perfect to earn that five. So just remember that perfection is not what we're striving here for and that this should give your students some leeway in knowing that they don't have to be perfect in order to do very well on this exam. Third, if you've taught AP Human Geography for at least two years, I really wanna encourage you to become an AP reader for the AP Human Geography exam. Being a reader allows you to gain an in-depth understanding of the AP exam itself, how we all use rubrics to assess student responses, and we also have opportunities for professional development. So it's a great opportunity to join a community of geography geeks like myself and many of the teachers here today. And as many other people who are here today can attest, being a reader will help you to help your students be more effective on the exam. Plus, actually, it's really a lot of fun. So when we first discussed creating this workshop for AP exam review, 
Our initial working title was 100 tips for teachers, but I realized that this would probably take us an entire week to get through. So I said, all right, just give me your top two for each of, each of our teachers here today. So we ended up with 10 top tips. It was not easy. It's kind of like selecting your favorite child, very difficult to do. But I hope that these 10 tips will get you going and inspire you to think about how you can construct some effective review for your students. So very briefly, our top 10 tips. The first three tips we're gonna start with are more of the general practices for overall review. And I'll start, we'll start with Alice and Cecil who will introduce the big ideas packet. We move on to Greg Hill who will, who will discuss mind mapping. Then to Greg Sherwin who will remind you about the practice uh, of one of the hardest skills that students struggle with, scale of analysis. Then we'll move on to focus on uh, the multiple choice questions. So Kevin Turner will cover how to use the AP Classroom to maximize effective use of a, a multiple choice question practice. He stays on to segue into our final uh, theme for the day, which is tips for SRQs. Um, he grounds us in those five command verbs that are so important for FRQ exams. Greg Sherwin returns to suggest ways to begin each lesson and each review session with some stimuli to help prepare for those FRQs. Greg Hill will introduce his particularly effective technique uh, of unpacking the FRQs in preparation for writing your responses. Celeste Reynolds comes in and gives us tips eight and nine. First, she'll discuss how she organizes students to do group FRQ reviews. And then she'll talk about one of the most difficult skills that students struggle with, and that is explain the degree to which. And she's got some great ideas on how you can really help your students understand what that particular phrase and task is asking. And then finally, Alice and Cecil will give us some of the best practices for testing protocols and how to handle the results when those, stores, when those scores come in. So it's my honor to introduce the all-star or A-team lineup for today. They are all teachers who have taught AP Human Geography for many years and have a depth of experience and tremendous wisdom to share with us today. First is Allison Cecil, who teaches at DuPont Manual High School in Louisville, Kentucky. She's been involved in AP Human Geography for a long time, helped to craft the CED. And of course, you know her because she helps to moderate the APHD teacher's Facebook page. And she's often the voice of calm and reason, especially during exam season. Uh, then Greg Hill, he teaches AP Human Geography at Dr. John Horn High School in Mesquite, Texas. If you follow uh, Greg on Facebook or Instagram, you will recognize that he is always traveling. So this has been a very challenging year for him. Um, no doubt you've seen Greg in some of the AP daily videos that he's helped to uh, put together this year. Celeste Reynolds teaches AP Human Geography at Mashpee Middle High School in Mashpee, Massachusetts on the Cape. Uh, when not out running long distance or zip lining, Celeste can be found organizing geography TEDx talks. Greg Sherwin teaches AP uh, Human Geography at Stevenson High School in Lincolnshire, Illinois. Some of you may know Greg because he's also a lead consultant for AP Human Geography. So you might have taken an APSI with him. Um, and he's also part of the brains behind iScore 5. Finally, Kevin Turner teaches AP Human Geography at Spanish River High School in Boca Raton, Florida. You can't miss Kevin because he's always wearing his Arsenal Football Club t-shirt and remarkably he's doing so today. Uh, you might also recognize him as one of the masterminds behind the AP Daily videos. Hi everyone. Um, so first of all, I was excited when we switched to Zoom because I didn't have to be out it about being in my car at my high school boys baseball game that got changed. Um, but I guess that does illustrate that like many of you, we are all juggling a lot of things um, from school to family um, and everything else. Uh, in the chat, I just placed a link to the big ideas packet. So my tip is going to relate to the big ideas packet. And I'm gonna give you two major tips with it. Um, one, you can have your students construct their own big ideas packet. 
and I'll briefly help you um, with some basic directions about that here in a moment. Um, and two, you could use the existing big ideas packet to review. So if you forward to the next slide, please, James. So the big ideas packet is something that I've been utilizing within my own classroom uh, for about 19 years, uh, regardless of which AP class I have taught, and I have taught many of them, but of course AP HG is my love, um, I have utilized this sort of review packet. And it's where each student gets a topic and then they are responsible for a page. Now, of course, there are lots of review books out there that are published and um, you know have high quality materials, but I like having something student produced because it puts it more in their language and then also um, I make it a bit of a competition of, with my students, like who can get quote published in the big ideas packet or not. So I have enough students where each student is assigned a page, but I'm able to typically double up on pages. One of the things that you'll notice with this slide is notice that the table of context, content says 2020 big ideas packet. And I've had several people, including Kevin, message me and say, hey, when's the 2021 big ideas packet coming out? It's not, that's the reality of this year. Um, so we have all had to decide which things to keep and which things to cut. And assigning this to my students as something to produce is one of the things that I had to make the tough decision to cut this year. So how will I still use it? Well, I will use it because it provides some easy one page overviews of topics for students. So what I do is I have the students take the table of contents and I have them um, highlight with three different color highlighters, topics that they feel most comfortable with, mm, kind of comfortable with to, oh, what, what is that? Um, and so I use a green, yellow, pink coding system, but it really doesn't matter what it is. You could also do a two tier system instead. And in addition to then using the packet to review, that helps many of us teach freshmen, them learn the skill of, you know, when you're studying, if you want to study effectively, you need to prioritize as opposed to just starting with like unit one and the first topic. Instead, I have them then look, what patterns do you see? Because obviously good geographers look for patterns. So what patterns do you see in terms of, did I highlight a lot of pink, which is my, I don't really remember this at all, uh, in a particular unit? If so, then that's going to be my unit that I focus on for review. James, if you'd forward to the next slide, please. So the advantage of the big ideas packet is that it's student produced. It also, um, for us, for my students, it correlates with our textbook, uh, but that doesn't really eliminate anyone from using it. Um, and I have them include examples when possible, because of course we want to get away from students simply memorizing vocabulary, one of the most popular questions, as many of you are aware, on the AP Human Geography Facebook group is where's the vocab list, but we really need to get beyond that and understand terms and context, so it helps a little bit with that. However, as you see that I put on this slide, there are some limitations. One, concepts are isolated to a page. In reality, concepts should weave all throughout the course. You're never actually finished with a unit or even really an individual topic. Um, and so students do need to be able to link ideas across units and across topics. And so I couple this as a basic content review with other strategies such as concept mapping or mind mapping that Greg's going to go into in just a moment. Also, one thing to just be aware of, you're welcome to share this with your students if you find it valuable, but examples are often tied to Louisville, Kentucky, because that's where my students are. So one of the things that you might want to do is challenge your students to come up with examples of as many of the concepts on the pages as possible that are relevant to their area. Um, if you end up with any questions about the Big Ideas Packet, just let me know and I'm happy to answer them. It's not perfect. It has a few mistakes in it, but nothing that's like material in terms of um, large conceptual issues. Um, and you'll of course find all the other published works also have their own errors. So I will now hand it off to Greg with our next tip.
Thank you, Allison. Um, first of all, I want to thank the American Geographical Society uh, for having us all here today. It's uh, an honor to be a part of this and uh, just want to share my love of geography. So I'm going to take the, uh, the football from Allison and uh, in terms of, of linking concepts. And I, I always tell my students, it's really important. They'll hear me say it. I'll drill it in their heads to connect the dots. Uh, you can't get tunnel vision um, in a particular uh, uh, concept or a particular uh, part of the CED. You've got to be able to connect across uh, the CED across the content. Uh, so James, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so I always talk about uh, you know using mind maps. You may call them concept maps. You may call them mental maps. You know what have you? Uh, that's totally up to you. Uh, but what I do is, again, try to get the students to connect this content across the CD. And it's very evident going forward, especially from last year on, uh, that students are able to do this, not just in multiple choice questions, but also in their FRQs. Uh, so what I and just kind of give you a quick overview of how I set this up is um, I try to mix one strong student in each group. That way it kind of keeps the thing going. So, you know, you don't have a group that's sitting there and just kind of, you know, in la la land for lack of a better term um so what i do is i'll take four to five terms and i'll try to take them from you know seemingly unconnected um parts of the ced and and give them to each group and, and of course they'll look at it and say this this makes no sense uh but at the end of it it, it totally starts to click and starts to gel uh james you go to the next slide and so there's a gazillion ways you can put together mind maps uh, one of the things I always get a lot of the our kids that are in fine arts, whether it be in band, whether it be in choir, uh, and also a lot of kids that like to draw. So there's a gazillion ways, and I stole this off of Google, but there's a gazillion ways you can do it. I always try to get the kids to, you know, hey, draw pictures, you know, take the main concept and branch out is really the big idea. Uh, kind of still in kind of piggybacking on what Allison said. Uh, I also like the kids to use a lot of different colors. I know in the exam, they can only use one color of ink and one color, a pen, a pen or a pencil. Um, but in terms of this particular idea, uh, I try to get them to use colors to kind of crystallize those, those concepts and see where those connections are um, across the CED. James, you can go to the next slide. And so what I do is, again, I give them um, five uh, words, four to five words, depending on, on where we are, um, and just, hey, how do how these connect? I, you know, I'll give them uh, anywhere from 15, 20 minutes, um, and then each group has to present uh, what they came up with. And, and, the, and the audience is charged with uh, questioning uh, whether those uh, connections are made or also offering suggestions of things they may have missed. Um, so to speak. And it's really, really great. It's really, really engaging. And it, it's one of those things I like to do where you kind of, um, kind of, you know, you have that one kid that's just, you know, I, I, I'm gonna go ahead and say it for the lack of a better term, just soaks up oxygen all year and really doesn't do a lot, but accidentally learns something from doing this exercise. Um, so it's really, really um, one of my favorite things to do. Uh, throughout the rest of the year. You can go to the next one, James. And so here's again, here's one of the finished, kind of a finished product. Uh, again, kids like to doodle and, and make connections. Um, and so this is one of my favorite things to do. And if you have any questions, my email's on this. Um, or if you have any suggestions, send them my way. I love, I'm, I'm always uh, game for new ways to make things better. And so I'll pass it off to the more famous Greg, Greg Sherwin. I don't think I'm the more famous Greg. Greg Hill, thank you very much. He used a um, football metaphor. So I guess uh, I'll say opening day was right here. So it's time to play ball, everybody. Um, thanks so much. Um, that's me at Wrigley Field. I got to see a World Series game. So maybe that's making me feeling pretty happy. Um, what we need to talk about is this idea that you learn over time as a teacher. And to me, it's that idea that your textbook and your references in class have to span many different scales of analysis. Oftentimes the textbook might only talk at a regional scale or only use examples about a country. As teachers, and as you become more of a veteran teacher, what you learn is how to give examples in class that are regional at a country scale, 
within a country and then even local scale. And so that's what I wanna remind you to do at the end of the year so students are well-versed on multiple choice and FRQ questions. Let's go to the next slide. So in the CED, you will find that uh, scaled analysis is one of the skills that the college board is saying, hey, your students better be well-versed at this, right? And everything, if you look at 5A, can they just identify it on maps? You know, whether it's quantitative or qualitative data, can they identify different scales of analysis? To, as you start to go down to 5B and 5C and 5D, can they really start to compare and, and you know, explain a concept at various degrees of, of scale, right? And so to me, this is a skill that is probably as teachers, you know, harder to do because sometimes our sources only have them at one scale. So it's a good reminder to all of us throughout the year when we do our presentations to make sure that we're hitting various scales of analysis. Okay, let's hit the next one. So some things to remember, and you can just click on all of it here, just go right ahead, just click on the whole slide, and that way we don't have to worry about things. But as we look at map scale, that's really, right, how we are presenting, or how the map is presented to us, whether it's a large scale map or a small scale map, sometimes all we're seeing is um, a localized area. Sometimes what we're seeing is a map of the world and that's just map scale, but scale of analysis. Now this is the key guys, here's why you came to Nick. Scale of analysis is that scale of aggregation. On a choropleth map, it's that unit of measurement that we're using to compare to another unit of measurement. So are we comparing a country to a country? Are we comparing a state or province to another state? or province? Are we comparing a city to a city? Ladies and gentlemen, that's what scale of analysis is. And it's a tough concept. Students struggle with it. Teachers struggle with it. So I'm hoping that all of you will get a better idea of that by, by kind of seeing what I like to do at the end of the year. So at the end of the year, what I'd like to do is give students a reminder of scale of analysis. So here we go. Let's click on the next slide. And so what you see here, right, is I'm going to give you a series of maps, right? And what I'd like to do at the end of the year to review is to remind students of that concept that they learned in unit one. So identify the scale of analysis. Now, this is a world map, right? So the map scale um, is, is one thing, but the scale of analysis here scale of analysis is going to be at a country or national scale of analysis. Why is this the case? Because if you take a look, you're seeing one country being compared to another country being compared. So this is a country scale of analysis. Next one. Okay, now we're looking within the United States. So while this is a map of the United States, this is at a county scale of analysis. And again, what you wanna do here is tell your kids, this is a map of the United States at a county scale of analysis. Moving on, we can see here, again, this is a map of Georgia. So now, so that's the map scale, but the scale of analysis, right, is going to be at a county scale of analysis. So while it is a map of Georgia, the scale of analysis is at a county because you're comparing county to county. Continuing on, we can see sometimes even bar graphs can be used to give students an idea of the scale of analysis. Here, it's a country scale of analysis. How do I know? It's country to country to country to country, right? So even get them to understand non-map data can be presented this way. Let's move on to the next one. Again, I like to flip the bar graph and just see if the students really got the concept. Same concept here, right? Scale of analysis is at a country scale. And I think I have a few more here. Yep, we're looking at, again, uh, just another chart here. And then, again, if you're looking at it country to country, we can see there, whoops, on the last one, it was a country. On this one here, the next one, we can see that this is going to be at a regional scale of analysis or um, I like to say the word realm for this, but regional scale of analysis. So there, there we go, folks. I think that was the last one. Maybe I have one more. 
Oh yeah. So this last one is kind of confusing for students because you have this data chart, but basically what you can see is a map of Mexico, but it is at a city scale of analysis because it's comparing cities. So at this point, I think I'm gonna be turning it over to Kevin Turner here. So uh, Kevin, um, here you go, my friend. Thank you so much, Greg Sherwin. Uh, you know, it's a tough act to follow right there, but uh, like uh, Greg Hill mentioned earlier, I would just like to say thank you so much for your patience and your persistence in hanging with us. Uh, you know, we, we were talking about it in our little green room, you know, as a teacher, haven't we all had this happen to us repeatedly throughout the year? Uh, we're all doing the best that we can. And uh, we know that you're working really hard for your students as well. Uh, so anyway, I am Kevin Turner. Uh, you usually can recognize me, like Lisa said, from the Arsenal Apparel, uh, otherwise known as Spatial Shark. Uh, but uh, I am in Boca Raton, Florida, or at least that's where my students live. The teachers generally can't afford to live in Boca Raton, but we try to get close. So James, if you'll go ahead and get me started. Um, basically, what I wanted to really reassure you guys about, whether you're a new teacher, whether you are a veteran teacher, or somewhere in between, um, you know, it's kind of like uh, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, you know, uh, Dorothy was fearful, nobody knew what to expect, there was this mystery, this, this uh, vagaries of, of who the wizard was, but once you pull back the curtain, you kind of find out, oh, wait a second, that's not really is what, what I thought it was going to be. Everything we're talking about for my set here is in the CED, and we all have a copy of that. So I would strongly encourage you, you really need to go through that CED and not just the unit planning and not just the topics and the skills, but the whole back end of your CED is nothing but testing information. And it really reveals to you a lot of how the test is constructed. Um, and having worked for years on, um, you know, the, the teams of, of I item writers, you know, I can just tell you that my little talk here, uh, I think is something that sharing it with kids, it kind of um, desensitizes them to the fear of this, you know, high stakes examination. And uh, I love what Lisa said earlier, you know, we don't need your kids to be perfect. You know, <laughs> your kids can score very well on this exam and earn college credit, uh, even with a score that their mom might not want to put on the refrigerator at home. Right. So James, if you'll go ahead and hit me to the next slide. Um, so, you know, obviously, like I said, exam information, James, we can flip through that one, save us a little bit of time. So if you go back into your CED, you're going to see that there's a big exam overview. Right? And at the risk of being a little bit boring to those who've been there and done that, uh, if you're that teacher that maybe this is your first time or even your second time, and you know, you want to know, remember last year in, in the COVID pandemic world, we kind of, you know, did an option, you know, we, we did a, we did a, a big change of route because of the format of the exam with everybody being online. This year, we're going back to this idea, 50% of the test being multiple choice, 50% of the, the test being the FRQs. Um, and remember that the timing is there. It's going to show you, you know, 60 minutes for 60 multiple choice questions. I always like to train my students throughout the year, work on that idea that you're going to have about a minute of processing time. And that's to read the question. That's to look at the answers, figure out any distractors, look at parallels and patterns like that. Um, and then with the with the essays, it's very important, I think, especially if your school is a paper pencil option school, is to get kids when they open up that booklet, they don't have to write those FRQs in the order that they see them. They don't have to write the first one first. They can actually do a little bit of self-analysis and say, which of these three prompts do I think that I would prefer to write? Because remember, in a limited amount of time, you're trying to score as many points as you possibly can earn. All right, James, go ahead. So when we think about the, the breakdown of the exam, then we also have to remember that we teach seven topics across our course. And so those topics are going to be relatively equally weighted, except, of course, for unit one, which is our, you know, thinking geographically topic. But once we get into uh, the other uh, units of study, you know, it's, it's essentially going to be, and if you do the math, you know, you divide 60 there by, you know, nine questions or so, that's going to get you to about 54 questions if you do it uh, by those percentages. And then go ahead and throw a few unit one questions in there as well. All right. Thank you, James. Go ahead. And that's 
you know, this, this little slide here is showing you section one, but now not so much by the topical uh, breakdown, but now remember everything about our CED, we marry the topics and the skills, right? Some of you may have seen some of our AP Daily videos. That was one of the things that we really wanted to strive for was uh, helping teachers and of course students understand that it's not just a topical uh, examination, it's also skill-based. So the concepts and the processes, you know, that jumps out there uh, being the largest share, all right? But when you look at skill two, where we're going to make relationships, right, connections, as you go down through, and, and, and I shared that skill sheet with my students, kind of like the first week of school, I wanted them to see what these skills are, and what they say that they're, they're not just what they know, but what they're able to do, right, with the information that they've learned. So when we go down through, you've got the spatial relationship part, uh, three and four are all about the data, but of course, three is quantitative, four is qualitative. So, uh, and a big fun fact with the qualitative, it's visual analysis, you know, you can teach your kids. That means, you know, you're going to see pictures, you're going to see imagery, you're going to have to break down what you're seeing in the picture, right? So then you get to that ultimate one that Greg did so well with us, scale, uh, scale of analysis, which is skill set five. So, you know, you can see exactly what, when we write test items, what are we testing kids on? And remember, good questions should never trick a well-prepared student into a bad answer, but there are going to be really good distractors, right? So sometimes I think it's important for your students to get a lot of practice with the topics and the skills. James, go ahead. So uh, if you look down there at the bottom, uh, one other thing that I wanted to point out, and, and that's why I probably put that red O there to make sure that I read the fine print, set, uh, sets of questions, all right? Lately, they've been asking us to create a lot of sets, item sets. So you may have a visual stimulus, and then you may have a set of questions that follow it. All of the questions will refer back to the single stimulus. Uh, generally, you can plan on about six to eight item sets in uh, the, the exam. And of course, as you know, um, you know, on the, on the FRQ side, you know, you got three standalone prompts, right? So we're talking about the MCQ section one here. So that's about 18 to 24 questions. And it's important to note that in the set, every question needs to refer back to the image, right? You should not be able to answer the question without using the stimulus. And we're gonna put them into somewhat of a hierarchical order of difficulty. That first question is gonna be kind of at emerging level of difficulty for a student. The second question is gonna be kind of proficient level of difficulty. And then that third one is gonna be advanced, right? Uh, so that's important, I think, to remember the, the sets and the stimulus-based questions as well. All right, James, let's go. So uh, this is, I, I made a reference to the skill sheet that I share with my students. Of course, it's in your CED. Uh, you know, I basically took a picture, shot it out on Google Classroom. Every kid kind of has it. We can reference it throughout the year as I teach on a fairly daily basis. Um, you know, I always am reminding my kids as we, you know, what I do a lot is I go through the CED with them day by day and I show them where are the topics and where do the skills match up. Not that the skill that's in the CED will always be the same skill married to the topic, but it just gives them great examples to be able to work with the topics and the skills, right? And apologies, you know, I tried to blow that up a little bit and it's a little blurry, but you can see it in all of its clarity inside the CED. James, thank you, sir. So very quickly, how does this now connect to AP Classroom? And what an amazing tool that we now have available, right? Just a couple of years ago, uh, we didn't have this. And I think uh, I tell my students all the time, there's no group of kids that have ever had more resources than you guys do, because we keep adding to uh, the arsenal of what teachers can, can use to help their students. So if you go into AP Classroom, uh, I'm gonna talk to you real quick about the use of that progress dashboard feature. Obviously, you know, with the progress checks, you can see their scores, but by using the progress dashboard feature, you're able to make now some comparisons across, uh, you know, your different, if you have multiple sections of classes, like I do at my school, uh, but also if you just want to look holistically at the group as, as, as a group at large. James, go ahead. 
So once you click on that progress dashboard, it's going to ask you which classes do you want to use. Now, this is my school, Spanish River, in uh, School District of Palm Beach County. You can see I teach multiple sections, and let's say I choose uh, period five, right? Now, remember that I'm only marginally better at a lot of this. You know, I, I, I spent a lot of time, obviously, with AP Classroom and AP Daily over the last year, but I still don't feel like I've, I've learned everything that's out there. So please don't take this as, you know, uh, oh, I have to be able to do all of these things. You know, AP Classroom is going to be a little clunky at first, but it starts to get a little more intuitive the more you practice with it and the more you try. So don't be overwhelmed. They have amazing uh, little help parts. You can, you can ask a colleague, feel free to contact us. Uh, we're here to help, right? We want to help you. So if you go ahead, James, to the next slide, once I open up period five, it's then going to give me, um, you know, and, and this is fairly recent. My kids just did unit six last week. Uh, but of course, we were building the slideshow before that. Uh, and so we'll, we'll be hitting unit seven over the next couple of days. But when you look at the data here, it's going to show you on the MCQ progress check. And then it, you see how it says unit one, unit two, unit three, unit four, unit five. And it's showing you the students. And of course, you notice that it's color coded. How are the students doing? 75% or better? Are they between 50 and 75%? And so on. I chose to highlight, for example, unit three. Let's say I'm reviewing and I want to go back and I want to, you know, uh, you know, students might self-identify. Which unit do they think they need to go back and review? Well, we can use data to help us make those decisions, right? And we've got a scoring bar at the bottom. 14 kids were in that 75 to 100% range. Only one kid, you know, random guessing down there below 25%, right? Remember, five answer choices, so 20% 20, 20 random guessing. All right, James, go ahead. Well, what's really cool then is that when you open up the student scoring, they're going to they're gonna get a report there that shows them uh, topic by topic within the unit, how did they perform? Well, obviously, I'm not as worried about the three out of three. I'm worried about let's target the zero out of three. Where can we grow? Uh, I'm a big believer in this growth mindset idea. Let's take some training wheels off the bikes, right? And let's get these kids out there and let them fall down uh, because then we can encourage them and empower them to get back up and get better, right? Again, they don't have to be perfect. We just want them to improve. We want them to learn and grow, right? And again, don't worry about, you know, at where are they at in terms of yellow versus green? As long as everybody's moving, right, then that's going to be a victory for us and, and empower those kids to feel that way. Because I noticed in the chat, please don't make any judgments about, oh, I have a lot of yellow. I have a lot of, you know, whatever color you can help kids grow. And, and again, give the kids empowerment to grow. All right. All right. So, James, as we go to the next one, uh, now I can click on, say, that yellow zero out of three. And then I can actually go through and see question by question what three questions were part of that set. And I can see that it was married to skill 4A, which means I can let the kids refer back to that skill. Uh, it'll show me in green how many got it right versus red how many got it wrong. So I can see, was that an easy question? Was that a moderate question? Was that a difficult question? Um, I can actually then go into the topic questions as you see the middle arrow there going in two different directions. All right, they can actually go back and practice on their own, or even better, they can go out and, and click on a relevant AP Daily video. More on that in just a second. And then notice that it'll not only give them the right and the wrong answer, you can see the check mark and the X down there, but it will actually then give them the, the, the explanation of why it's right or why it's wrong. So really, AP Classroom has just opened up so many awesome opportunities for kids to self-check, self-evaluate, and, and to grow, right? Now, if you go back to what I just said about the AP Daily videos, James, if you'll go ahead and click, you can now go into my friend Greg Hill, who did top, you know, Unit 3, and the kid can watch the video right then and there, immediate learning from a question that they may have missed based on the data that we're acquiring from the progress dashboard, all right? And of course, as, as we all know, Greg is devastatingly good looking there on his videos, right? All right, let's move on. So when you look at the, uh, the tools we have available, well now, right, all you have to do is assign those progress checks to your students, okay? These are not the ones that are behind the shield, 
which you have to do, you know, the lockdown browser, all that. I, I tried to stay away from the complicated because that's complicated even for me. I was trying to stay with the stuff that's basically pretty easy for us to use. You can assign those progress checks and then you can hit that button there that says students are going to get to see their results after scoring. The system, of course, scores it automatically. It's not a lot that you have to do. And then once you give them that access, right, you can really start to turn them loose and get them out there uh, learning about their, their mistakes and seeing how they can improve and get better. Remember, uh, we still have about a month before exam time. There's a lot of learning and growth that can happen in this last month, right? Now, I am slated to go back to back, right? So that was my tip four, was how to use uh, AP Classroom, AP Daily, and, and helping out with the MCQs. So now I'm gonna pivot and I'm gonna hit the five command verbs, that's still me. <laughs> so sadly, there's no improvement there. Uh, but here is uh, the next slide, uh, James, thank you. And we're gonna talk real quick about our five command verbs or our task verbs. Uh, if, you, um, you know, if you know uh, all of our items that we write, both MCQ and FRQ, uh, we now use these five verbs in the stem or in the prompt of the questions. Now, I always think this is interesting. This is also ripped straight out of the CED. I don't know that they've put these in order of difficulty, for example, and this might be something fun with your students to do, is think about, you know, look at the skill sheet, you know, and you'll see that identify and define are kind of up there at the top, and then it kind of goes to describe, and then it goes to explain, and then it goes to compare. So if you, if you put them into kind of a difficulty order, you certainly get a little bit of a different look than what this screen shows. But what I like about this is that it's going to show you a little bit of advice about what kids have to do do in order to be able to earn a point. And, and, and let's put this in the context, like it says, of, of the FRQs. So if we say define, you know, that's, again, straight up vocabulary. Uh, and Allison alludes to this, you know, where's the vocab list? Well, what I've done is I go through the CED and I pull out those terms, right, that are, that are going to be, you know, like our key terms, and certainly the textbooks, you can kind of merge those two lists and see what's what seems to be co uh, consistent. And, and I make quizlets, some people will do flashcards with their kids, all kinds of great tips and strategies on that. But define is pretty much just the definition, you're just writing a simple answer there. Identify, not a whole lot more, right? You can give an example uh, if you wish, but it's going to be pretty specific information when it's identified. It might say, identify a country with a high level uh, of development as measured by HDI. Again, it's going to be looking for patterns. The identify is the pattern, and then the process is where we're going to have to start doing some explanations, right? Now, if we think about describe, one thing I love to do with my kids is, you know, I'll say something like, describe your favorite pizza. And the thing I always want to draw home is that describe is going to have to be plural. It's got to be relevant characteristics, right? So what kind of pizza? You need to tell me about the crust. You need to tell me about the toppings. You need to tell me if it's from uh, delivery. Is it something you make at home with your family and you're rolling out your dough? Uh, is it something where it's you know, store-bought or frozen and you're just popping it in to the toaster oven? descriptions have to be in rich details. So generally, this is going to require the student to have a bit of a longer response than say define or identify, right? When it comes to explain, it's going to answer that question of how or why. And uh, I've heard many great teachers, uh, you'll hear this <laughs> as you hang around human geography teachers, pretend that there's a three-year-old taking the exam with you because the child will continue to ask why, why, why? Because the explanation is gonna have to include some degree of cause and effect, some, de some degree of before and after. It's gonna have to have a because in the answer generally to get credit. And then finally, the compare task verb, the one that I think kids struggle with the most, uh, because compare for us, uh, a lot of kids, they'll say they want that to say compare and contrast. But here, 
we're looking at only the word compare, but it is similarities and differences. Uh, make sure your students write about both things. If they're asking them to compare two different countries, if they're asking them to compare, uh, you know, two different concepts or topics, you got to talk about both. It could be models, it could be theories. Uh, you can't just talk about one or the other. You have to have both in your answer and you got to talk about similarities and differences. All right. That's my five command verbs, and that is pretty much it for me. Now we go back to Greg Sherwin, and he will take us to our next tip. Hey, thanks, Kevin. I really appreciate that. So, guys, I don't have enough time to review. How many teachers say that? Oh, my God, FRQs, 50% of the exam. How do I grade them, right? These are the concerns that we have. So in my years of experience, I know that this is a spatial course, and I also know that I don't have time to grade FRQs. So I've come up with the idea of icebreakers and verbal FRQing. Guys, let's get them to say it out loud and then get their peers to help them give more detail if they haven't given enough in the response. That's a good describe, but can somebody give me more detail? Who's got another example? And get the crowdsourcing to go, but do it vocally. And that way the kids can hear from each other and do it vocally so you don't have to grade it. All you have to do is be the orchestra leader and conduct the music. So let's see what we got here. Take a look, quick look here. Let's head over, yeah. So here's a map. You know, this is an icebreaker. Put it up at the beginning of the class, right? And so you think to yourself, you put up some sort of stimuli, right? Because stimuli are going to be parts of the exam. And these stimuli are either going to be quantitative data or qualitative. Obviously, this is a quantitative map. And so, boom, we could sit there and start thinking as teachers, what are some of the task verbs we could ask? So let's take a look. James, next. There it is. So identify the type of map, or what did we just do in my presentation before? Identify the scale of analysis. So the type of map is a chloropleth map, Mr. Sherwin. Nice job. The scale of analysis is at a country scale, but nice job. But now we got the identify. Now we're going to go, well, can somebody define this map's about natural uh, increase rate? Can somebody define that? Right? Ooh, can somebody, you know, give that detail? Ooh, can you compare the pattern for Africa with Europe? Now we're starting to get into the similarities and differences that Kevin just mentioned. And then can you explain one economic reason which would can, uh, account for the rate of natural increase of Europe? So can we start now taking unit to unit, right? Now we're thinking about what is happening economically. So again, all the idea is an icebreaker, put up a map and come up with your own kind of uh, um, verbs, task verbs to go along with that. Let's look at what else would I have here. Kevin, next one. Thank you. Ooh, one of the harder questions is the explain uh, the, uh, the degree. And I know that's gonna be covered later on, but you can even add a question like explain the degree to, uh, to which a country in South Africa would want to adopt a pronatalist policy. So think about how advanced that type of question is. And what I like to do with my verbal FRQing is I just love the idea of identify, start with that, because that gets them in the game, then go to define, get them into the game, and then end with this, right, where they have to take pronatalist policies and bring it back to South America and explain it, right? That's a tough, that's a spicy meatball, but I think that those students can get it done if you kind of set them up in a group setting. All right, so let's move on. You can do this with maps, you can do it with charts and graphs and uh, population pyramids. So on this one, here's some of the questions I've come up with. James, thank you, next. Identify the, you could just identify the number of people. And so what I wanna do here is, do they know what a cohort is? Can they make sure, can they identify not just the male side, but the male and the female side? Can they actually read, a, read the data? Guys, I believe the AP exam FRQs is going to have kids be able to, to be uh, graphic literate. They're going to have to be able to understand this. So this is a key factor. So they're going to have to do this. Now, when you start getting into the describe, compare, and define with this one, this is a pretty unfortunate population pyramid. Because if you can look at the, the pyramid, you're going to be seeing a lack of females. So now you can start talking about issues of gender selection, 
uh, gender side and some of those heavier topics as you start to explore down here because the female side um, is, is much lower than the male side. So you can see that there is some gender selection going on in India and that covers some of those tougher topics that we discuss. But this graphic can get you to, to reacquaint students with that at the end of the year. Okay, moving on to our next slide. It's not just maps and it's not just charts, but you can do this with pictures. So here's some pictures I took of uh, a neighborhood in Chicago. So click on our, our question and James, thank you. Um, identify uh, the community that lives here. All right, well, that one's pretty easy to see that it looks like a Polish neighborhood based on um, the, the qualitative data that I'm getting. It's a Polish Catholic uh, cathedral. You can see the Polish door. Um, we can see uh, Pulaski. So you get this. Define cultural landscape. All right, so let's talk about that built environment and how it's how the cultural imprint. Let's get them to be able to do that. Describe the role of language and religion on the cultural landscape. Maybe even reference these photos. That would be a cool thing to do. Clicking on our next one. And then you can get into a harder question, explain how secret occupancy can be seen in this photographs. What's happened to this neighborhood in Chicago, it used to be defined heavily as a Polish neighborhood, but there's been an out migration of Poles to the suburbs and an in migration of Latinx, uh, specifically Mexican Americans to this neighborhood. And if you can look in these photographs, you can see Spanish, you can see 15 años for the quinceañera. Um, so you can see that and then you can see even um, Polish and Spanish and English in the landscape. So again, this is a great way to familiarize your students with concepts without overloading them with uh, lots of reading material. Using photographs can get them back into the game. I'm pretty certain this is my last slide and that I get to turn it over to the Salsa King of Cincinnati. Um, oh, sorry, I actually do have one more slide. Salsa King, you're gonna have to hold on one second, Greg Hill. Um, you can target um, AP Classroom um, and you can find stimuli there in AP Classroom and you can target the questions. I would even suggest taking a stimulus, taking a screenshot of the stimulus and just putting it in without a question and just creating your own. So those stimuli live in AP Classroom. Kevin, thank you so much for referencing it. To me, I think that would be a key thing to do. Now I think I get to turn it over to Greg Hill, who you may not know, but he is the salsa king of Cincinnati whenever he gets down for the AP reading. Greg Hill, it's your dime, it's your dance floor, my friend. All right, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, Kevin, uh, the check should be in the mail for using my likeness. Uh, hopefully by Thursday I can use that. Um, and second of all, Kevin, thank you for that 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 great uh, uh, got a word. Anyway, I look good without filters. Thank you, I appreciate that comment though. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about um, exam detectives. Um, one of the things that kids really struggle with is how to organize their thoughts or how to, de you know, you've seen a lot of strategies on how to deconstruct, um, you know, whether it be the command verbs or, or things like that. And pretty soon you'll see a couple other things of how to take that even further with my great friend Celeste. Um, so I want to talk about, uh, you know, many of us watch uh, detective shows, uh, whether it be uh, NCIS or Law and Order which is my favorite, and I call this approach, you can go to the next slide, James, law and order, the law and order approach to attacking exam questions. Originally, I, I developed this, I kind of stole it actually from when I taught AP US history, um, but uh, I really designed this at first to use it on FRQs, you know, because kids um, oftentimes just see the prompt and just start writing and just start writing. And they'll get to a point, we see this at the reading a lot where a kid will, have a thought, they'll just think it's what, what the question is supposed to be, then all of a sudden, uh-oh, uh that's not what they're asking, and then they have to start all over, and they don't get to finish the thought, and that really hurts their score. So one of the things I tell my students is, you can't write about what you know, what you don't know about, so, and that includes the writing prompt, and so we like to deconstruct the writing prompt, and I've also, too, uh, having served on the test development committee this past year, uh, have adapted it for multiple choice questions. And in terms of 
uh, especially those with stimuli and things like that. And so a couple of things I, I want the kids to do is let, let's deconstruct this because what do detectives first do is they're looking for evidence. What's the evidence telling me? Um, you know, and give them that time to kind of accurately um, give an accurate analysis of, of the evidence that they're seeing. And so, you know, this works really easy with paper tests. If you're doing paper tests, this is really, really easy and, and, and not, a, um, not hard to do. Digitally, you might have to, they might have to do more so in their mind. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know the, you know, they could take scratch paper. I don't know what the, the you know, ramifications for that are. Uh, but that's something I'm developing uh, as we go on and take the digital test. Let's go into the next one, James. And so here's one, an example using a multiple choice question. Um, and so, you know, before we even look at the answer choice, I mean, you can even look at the answer choice and deconstruct those. But again, and this is something here in Texas, we take this thing called the star test. Um, and I wrestle with my kids um, and tell them that, you know, with the star test, you have all freaking day to take it. With the AP exam, your biggest enemy is the clock. You don't have all day. So we got to get in there, uh, you know, figure out what we're doing and get out of there. Kind of like a stealth bomber. Next uh, one, James, please, sir. And so, you know, we look at, you know, what are the, you know, the command verbs? Uh, you know, what are the vocabulary words? What are the models? What are the geographers? We want to highlight those. And I let the kids, you know, kind of you know, freely choose what they want to do with, you know, if they want to, you know, you know, start as, hey, you know, circle the verbs, you know, square around the vocabulary words, um, what have you have, any important word that kind of gives you a hint towards the, the answer. On to the next one, James. And so here, uh, uh, and so looking at FRQs, uh, again, one of the first things I tell my kids is take about five minutes to, um, you know, deconstruct. What are you seeing? Uh, you know, give, give yourself a roadmap of, of what you need to write. On to the next one, James. And so, you know, and this is one, and, and my good friend Carter, we kind of talked about this uh, in the chat that, uh, you know, looking at maps and deconstructing maps is, I think, is a lost art in human geography. Um, and, and the way that we've gone in the CD, I, th I really liked how we're now incorporating more maps. And, and as Greg and others talked about in terms of scale analysis. Now we're putting those, those two major realms of geography together. And so here again, you can see, and again, I like the, my kids are really colorful. I have one young lady, she has a color code for everything. Um, and so deconstructing even the stimulus and the title of the stimulus, and I already tell the kids that even the stimulus can lead you in the, the title of the stimulus can lead you in the right direction. To the next one. And here's probably one of my favorite FRQs of all time. And I know some of us on this call graded this uh, FRQ. Um, and, and uh, you know, just what we saw with a lot of kids is they, did, they didn't read the full question. They didn't read the stimulus. And they just kind of haphazardly just started answering the question without reading it. On to the next one, James. And so, e again, even with the stimulus, you know, deconstruct that. What is it telling me? Resist gentrification. What's going on in the picture? Um, what do you see? What do you think it's like for the people that live there? That's another part of the deconstruction. Um, and then another thing um, I tell my kids for the paper test is write all over the test booklet, even in on the inside page. Write, every, every, write any notes, anything you need to. On that inside flap, on that on that uh, that uh, last flap, those are all full game. Now they won't grade it, but it's there for you to jot down notes. On the writing prompt, write down everything you know, definitions, uh, geographers associated with uh, this particular writing prompt. Um, you know, demographics. What is that? You know, and so I'll have a kid, uh, maybe you know, drawing. You know, I have kids that like will draw an arrow from that and define demographics. Um, and then start to answer the writing prompt. Because again, it saves a lot of time. It saves a lot of kids from having to scribble through all two, three, four paragraphs of what they wrote and, and go ahead and answer the writing prompt. On to the next one. And I think that's it for me. And so we go to my great friend and zip line extraordinaire, my good friend, Celeste Reynolds. Thank you, Greg. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, AGS, for this. I, I'm learning a lot of things from my colleagues, so this is wonderful. Um, 
I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today. I we've been hearing from you know the the great you know from Allison with the big the big ideas packet. We talked about how you can use AP Classroom. Greg's given us some great ways of uh, thinking about how you're using visuals and maps and reviewing. And a lot of you, I don't know how many of you are teaching ninth graders, but I do to AP Human Geography. And many of them look at me uh, and say, how do I study all of this? And Mrs. Reynolds, I don't know how to study. So in the classroom, when I'm framing, um, when I'm in classroom, we're working on certain skills, but when they're on their own or when they get together with their friends. So I have after school study sessions um, actually, and I, I do these mini review sessions before units. Um, they're voluntary, you know, they can, vo they can volunteer to come. I do record them, so if they miss them. And what happens is I try to get students, I'm a firm believer that if students um, can talk about a concept um, and discuss it with one another, it really helps them to internalize that material and get more comfortable with it. So I have review sessions for about an hour. Sometimes they go an hour and 15 if the, if the students are, they're like, yes, we wanna keep going. Um, but usually I try to keep them around an hour because it, it does take some time. It, when I'm in person, I break the students into three or four groups, but lately I'm in a hybrid situation. So I have my students, uh, most of my students are in Zoom. And what we do is I put them into breakout rooms. Um, James, you can go to the next, sorry, slide. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and so what I do is I try to get FRQs from each unit um, using different prompts. So I'm looking at those task verbs that, um, that Kevin was talking about. I try to pull in different maps and analysis from different units and different visual, visuals so they're, they're getting a variety. Uh, and then what I do is I ask them in a group I say you have 10 minutes because I'm a very firm believer that they need to outline what they're going to answer. So like what Greg was saying earlier, it's really important for them to read that, uh, identify their task verbs, what the question is asking, analyzing uh, what the, the visual is saying and what they're supposed to, what kind of information they're supposed to be getting from that, and then being able to organize what they're going to say so that they can write a strong FRQ. I also think that this is a very good way to uh, prepare for your multiple choice exam questions as well. So what I do is I put them in a groups of three and four. I give them 10, uh, one FRQ. Uh, if they're in person, they each get their own sheet. Uh, if I've been doing it in Zoom, so I've been breaking them out into breakout rooms and I give them uh, I kind of, what I do is I, I shoot them in the, the, the chat, their, their FRQ, and then they get 10 minutes. And I do assign roles, by the way. I assign somebody who is kind of leading that discussion and leading kind of, you know, who's doing this, and then everybody should be taking their own notes. And, and what I do is they have 10 minutes to figure out how are we going to answer this. And that, that is a really great way because they get 10 minutes, that's it, and we move on to the next FRQ. What the students see is what they know and what they don't know. They start to identify what skills they, they are strong at, what you know, uh, task verbs that they really are comfortable with and ones that they're not. And so that starts for them to be able to go back to those resources and say, okay, in unit two, I wasn't really comfortable with this. And so I'm gonna go back and either the, the big ideas packet or I'm gonna go back in my textbook or I'm gonna go back into the AP daily classroom and watch the AP daily video so that I can kind of go back over that concept. Because what I say to them, there are things that you really know well and there's the things that you really don't know well. And with the, you know, you don't have to study everything you need just to kind of go over the things that you really don't know and the skills that you need to, to work on. So that's kind of a strategy that I think that has my students really enjoy. They love it. And by the way, they're not allowed to use any, any, any type of notes or anything like that during this review session. 
because I want them to be able to recall. Uh, and then if they want to go back, they have that sheet or they have that document uh, online and they can go back and start re going back and figuring out what they know and what they don't know and kind of reviewing uh, on their own. So it kind of helps them kind of um, figure out how to prepare when they're studying on their own. Hi, uh, James, if you could go to the, the next slide. So this has come up, um, explain uh, the degree to which, and uh, this is kind of one of those things where my students look at it and they just, ah! you know, uh, what does that mean? I've never seen that before. And I think that that, I think a lot of teachers, I know I, at first I had a really difficult time and I actually went to uh, a uh, an English teacher with me and I said, help me. And he said, use visuals, Celeste. And I said, ah, oh, why didn't I think of that? And um, I was like, brilliant. So I use this in my room and I, I have this on a document. I have a degree, I, I kind of have like a spectrum and I always talk to my students. So when they see this pop, they're not, they don't freeze and they go, oh snap, I got this, right? Um, I say, first of all, you're going to see the question, you're gonna see this question. It's either gonna be asking you about a concept. It's gonna be asking you about a theory. It's going to be asking you about a model. And what you have to do to yourself is say, okay, um, what, to what degree, you know, to what degree does this concept or this model can be applied to the real world? And I say, so ask that question. Is it, does it high? Is it high? Yes, 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 it does. Or is it eh, yes or no, or not really, it really doesn't. And then once they figured that out, then tell me why. Walk through that process, that reasoning process, and tell the reader why you think that that is. And then give us some examples. Give that reader some examples why, yes, I think it is, because when I see this, this, and this, and then they, it shows what you're trying to explain. So I think that this was, uh, is a, a kind of a concept when you kind of, if you're thinking about it and your students are tripping over it, I do know that in AP Classroom, you can go in and select, I just wanna see FRQs and you can go under skills, by the way, I believe it's skills and you can click down to, I only want the questions that talk about explain, um, explain the degree to which. And I believe there's um, from unit two, there's one on Germany migration, unit three, there's, uh, I believe it's on loss of indigenous languages. Uh, there's from unit four, I think that talks about superimposed boundaries. And two from unit five, one is on rice, and I think green revolution. And the other one was on agriculture employment. So you can use those in your review sessions and making sure that your students are covering that and, you know, go over that, like go over that, you know, to explain to the degree to which and, and then show them the spectrum and tell them, think about that spectrum and then give them one of those FRQs. And then uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be uh, ready to go and, and say, oh, that's easy. Um, I'm making that more difficult than, than what it really is. So those are my few tips um, that kind of helps my, uh, my students. And I just wanted to share that. And I am going to zip my, uh, on over to Allison as she wraps things up for us today. Thank you, everyone. Hi again, everyone. So notice that for this, I used a picture of me scuba diving because are any of you feeling underwater at this point in time preparing for this test? <laughs> Um, so Lisa started with some really good advice, breathe. And so I would just like to, first of all, remind you to do that. And then next, I'd actually like to start with, before I talk about some of these tips and general exam prep, what this exam means for you as a teacher. So James, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. So let's pause and consider this. You were teaching AP Human Geography during a pandemic. And I don't think that we give ourselves enough credit, but let's really stop and think about it. So now I know that that doesn't really take the pressure off of us. We still all want our kids to do super well, but 
we need to remind ourselves of the challenges that we've gone through and that our students have gone through this year and that we continue to go through. Remember also when those scores do come out, this test is one measure of student performance on one day. Have any of you guys ever had a bad day? Yeah, um, it can be as simple as a bad day and that's okay, that's fine. I would like for you to reflect before the students ever take the test, where did your students start out this year? What did they know when they came into your classroom about local and global patterns and processes? Do they know more now? Do they have a better understanding essentially of how this world works? If so, that's a big deal. All right, because we're not just preparing students for one day, one test, we're preparing our students to be successful global citizens. Also, do not compare to others. So I know, you know, Kevin put those numbers up there and there were some concerns, wait, mine are a lot more yellow or that sort of thing. That's okay. Now it's natural to compare. We all are going to do that, but try to avoid comparing. Your students and their circumstances are unique. So I can't compare my scores to Celeste's scores. I can't compare them to either Greg or Kevin and really get anything of real value out of that. What I can do is, you know, if mine are higher, I can be like, oh, pat myself on the back. And if mine are lower, I can throw a pity party, but I don't know the circumstances of their teaching situation and their students. And we advocate all the time as teachers, when we are talking about scores to administrators, we're like, but it's so much more than that. And you don't understand when you're comparing me to that other school in the district, there's a different situation here. But then we turn around and oftentimes are guilty of doing the exact same thing. So we need to not do that because that just reinforces that, oh, scores are the end all be all and that you can compare and totally ignore situations. Be a good geographer as you're looking at scores. Greg talked about skill, uh, scale. Scale of data covers up a lot. So when you look at national pass rates, that covers up a lot of info. Are your students freshmen? Are they sophomores? Are they juniors? Are they seniors? What's their prior preparation? I know that within my classroom, I have different starting levels of students in terms of their preparation coming to me. Some of my students are a five walking in that door. Now that's not many of them, but I have some. So to say that I'm a good teacher because that kid got a five when they were already at or close to that five level, that's really misleading. It might be the kid who walks in your door and gets a two that is pro might be your biggest success story. So please, please, please keep that in mind. I know it's hard. I know we all wanna compare. And I know some of you are like, yeah, okay, you're saying don't worry about scores, but my, my evaluation, my administrators, okay, and worrying and obsessing over it's going to change nothing. And so you advocating for yourself and your students and being able to thoughtfully consider what your successes are beyond scores that's going to be then something that you can potentially respond with. Again, and I know it depends on your situation, but that's kind of the whole point of this. It depends on your situation, right? Do reflect. So I don't mean just ignore the scores, but do reflect. What went well, not just in terms of your student performance on the test, but reflecting back on your year. Uh, where do you need to improve? We can all always improve. So be real honest with yourself. You know, I can just say, oh, my kids are mainly urban kids, which is somewhat misleading since I'm currently using the Wi-Fi at a tractor supply company near the ball field, but I'm <laughs> two hours from home too. But my students are urban students, so I could be like, oh, that's why they don't do well on agriculture. Well, if I'm real honest, when I really reflected on that a few years ago, you know when my urban students weren't doing well on agriculture? Because I don't do well on agriculture. I was kind of like, eh, this is my least favorite. I know for some of you, it's your favorite and that's what makes us collaborating so beautiful. All right, so I was like, okay, I need to do a better job here. Um, and that's something that I changed, okay? Um, you know, 
Also, what are some common misconceptions for your, your students? What are some things that no matter how many times you said it, they tended to get twisted up, mixed up wrong? Okay, now the beautiful thing about teaching is next year, we start over again with new students, a new year. Hopefully fewer challenges, but regardless, new students, new year. So moving forward, how will I lay the foundation next year to address those misconceptions with future students? Because of course, oftentimes it's the same year to year. <laughs> yeah, and send them to GW, I think is Lisa's message. All right, so let's go to the next slide, please. So the other thing, my biggest tip is ignore rumors. And again, I know it's hard. I'm on the Facebook page and I heard this. I heard that. Well, you have access to the best source of information about what will be on the exam and how students will be tested. And so Kevin talked about that earlier. Um, and I think all of the presenters at least touched on that some. You have access to the best source of information. So that has not always been the case, but that is currently the case. So James, one more slide, please. The CED. And I know some of you are tired of me on the Facebook page saying, well, look at the course and exam description because that's like my favorite comment ever, I think. Um, and when people are like, will this be tested? Well, it's not in the CED. So no, it will not be directly assessed. That doesn't mean that you can't teach it if you find value in it and think that it illustrates something that's in the CED, but it will not be directly assessed. Those times I saw mention of the chicken question, the infamous chicken question, those times of those questions are over because we now have a document that more uh, spells out what students are going to be accountable for. So I know we have some trust issues sometimes, all right, um, with College Board and previous questions and things like that, but you really do need to stick to the course and exam description in terms of knowing what's going to be on the test. Again, you can teach beyond it, but if you're asking what's going to be on the test, instead of asking someone on Facebook, and I don't care who the person is, I don't care if it's me, go to the CED first, what's there? And not just is a word there, but what's the context of whatever is mentioned? Um, so, those of us doing digital, and I know some of you are doing all digital like my students are. Some of you are doing split where some students are taking it in person, pencil and paper, and others are doing digital and that could be at home or in person. And oh my goodness, what does that mean? Well, we don't know all the details yet. So here's my philosophy on that. Inside, I am panicked about my kids taking the digital test. I would much prefer them, even though it's earlier, to take paper and pencil. That's my honest truth. But I am not telling my students that. I'm telling them, you know what? The school in making this decision just gave us the big, this big advantage. We have longer. We can actually have a little bit of review time and we weren't going to have that before. Um, and so, you know, sometimes as teachers, we have to sell things. All right, so I'm selling that to them. And I'm nervous about it. And I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. And I just keep telling them, oh, that's nothing we need to worry about right now. We're still addressing content. We will talk about that later. In other words, once I figure out what the heck's going on. All right, um, so I think if we are calm, at least to our students, that that will help them. You know, for many of our students, many of our students are freshmen. For many of them, this is their first AP experience, and they are students within a pandemic. Um, and so we need to be that voice of calm, that voice of reason. Um, I have used the CED in terms of referencing with my students more than ever. Not that I expect them to read it. Read it. It's no novel. All right. But just like, look, it says here you're going to have three FRQs. They're each worth seven points. We know the first one is not going to have any stimulus material. We know the second one. And so there's a lot we don't know, but I'm not emphasizing that to the kids. I'm only emphasizing what we for sure do know, all right? So I do think we have to spin it positively. Now that doesn't mean that in the Facebook group, we can't express panic 
and we can't ask other people what are we doing and I don't know what's going to happen and yeah Brenda I'm with you I don't know how to organize those reviews if you're doing 50 50. Um, and so that's where we rely on the expertise of others and so my very last slide James. All right, so Lisa has on here um, to become an AP reader and she might want to reintegrate that I also would ask you to stay connected. Many of you are connected, and that's why you're here today. Continue to be connected. Um, so the AP Human Geography College Board page is not necessarily the most friendly in terms of design. It's not, if you try to access it on a wireless device, oh, it's terrible. Um, but especially going into the test, all right, um, I encourage you, I try to repost most things that I'm asked to post in there, again, on the Facebook group, but there's so much activity on the Facebook group, things get lost. Um, and so there's less clutter on the College Board community site. That's the official site. So I'd encourage you to be paying attention to that, especially these next few weeks. And then many of you are on the Facebook group, you know, stay involved there, support each other there. We are known for being one of the best communities of teachers and the best at supporting each other well more than a lot of the other subjects. So let's continue to do that and we will get through it together. All right, we survived last year. All right, we will get through it together. And um, I would just wanna thank you so much for joining us today, Lisa. So thank you, Allison, uh, and thank you all to all five of our amazing teachers for the incredible and inspiring 10 tips that they have covered today. We hope these 10 tips at least get you thinking about how you can start to get uh, ready for the AP Human, exam, uh, Human Geography exam review period. So it's now my pleasure to hand it back to John. That was terrific. Thank you, Lisa, Allison, Celeste, Greg, Greg, and Kevin. We are recording the information you heard today with all of the slides and we'll be posting it next week for all of you and any APHG teachers who couldn't be with us today, but might be interested. And as I say, every time we have the opportunity to get together, AGS is here to help, to be a resource for you. We do not charge for any of our materials for APHG teachers, including Daily Geo, and are here to be of service to you. So thank you again for joining us today. Have a great rest of the weekend. Good luck to you and your students on the upcoming exam. Bye-bye.